or online seminar uh, about urgent applications in homelessness cases and how they may be affected by the coronavirus. Um, now I'm just chairing the seminar today. We've got two expert speakers from our housing and social welfare team. Uh, first you're going to hear from Professor David Cowan down in Bristol and then you'll hear from ZNRB based in London. Now if you're new to Zoom or to online seminars uh, you'll see that your microphones have been turned off as has your video and that's to ensure that you always see the, the speaker so don't be concerned that your software is not working properly. Um, however we are inviting some questions during the, the seminar and we'd ask that you use the Q&A feature that appears at the bottom of your Zoom window and that should enable you to type in any questions uh, that occur to you as we go along and we'll make sure that we leave some time at the end of the seminar uh, so that we can try and address those. And lastly, um, we are recording the, the, the seminar today, so uh, it, it will be available on the website later on, along with the slides from the presentation. So uh, without more ado, I'm going to pass you on to uh, David Cowan down in Bristol to start the presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ben, and good afternoon to everybody from what is very, very sunny and beautiful Bristol. Um, uh, uh, as, as Ben says, this is a uh, webinar about uh, interim accommodation, uh, urgent applications, really, and, uh, and how uh, interim accommodation might be affected by COVID-19. And the way Zia and I are going to um, uh, uh, deal with this, Zia is in control of the um, of the slides. And I, um, Zia, would you just move on one one slide, please? Uh, and um, uh, and another one, please. I'm sorry. Uh, the the way we're going to structure our presentation is. Uh, I'm going to talk about Section 1881, interim accommodation pending uh, notification of by the local authority as to their decision about, about the duty they owe to uh, an applicant. Um, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that and then I'm going to talk about Section 190 and accommodation duty to those found intentionally homeless. Uh, and I'm then going to pass on to Zia, who will talk about the two discretionary uh, um, uh, accommodation powers uh, available to local authorities. And he's going to finish up just mentioning and talking about the administrative court guidance. So um, I'm moving on now to uh, section 1881, uh, uh, please, Zia. Uh, um, and for me, I think uh, there are at least two issues here. And, and this is, uh, or these are, first of all, what constitutes an application uh, to the local housing authority under part seven. Um, and secondly, what constitutes suitable accommodation? And the application question, I. I thought about as I woke up this morning and was listening to somebody talking about the way in which in Manchester they have rehoused. Um, uh, I think I, I can't remember I, in my head. I think it's a thousand uh, people, but I can't, can't be right. It must be a hundred uh, homeless people. Um, uh, and the question that the, that I've been thinking about is the extent to which that rehousing of uh, rough sleepers can constitute an application by by uh, by by the rough sleeper for accommodation under part seven, uh, and that really takes me on to thinking about what is an application and who is an applicant, and the provisions are in section one eight three, and I've underlined them on this slide here. Uh, well, I've underlined the relevant sort of bit. So the first thing is that the person must apply. And the second thing is the authority 
must have reason to believe, which we know is a low threshold, of course, that he is or may be homeless or threatened with homelessness. And the definition of an applicant is simply a person making such an application. Um, uh, and so, uh, see so if we can go on to, 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 to the next slide, please, because uh, uh, this is not an area that is, that is free from authority. Um, and uh, my starting points, and, and it's really also covered in the Code of Guidance as well, but, but uh, Mr. Justice Collins in our ways uh, talks about, in essence, that the, uh, the, there doesn't need to be anything in writing. Um, uh, uh, if it is simply apparent from what is said by an applicant that they may be homeless or threatened with homelessness, the duty is triggered. And the reason why is obviously because we're dealing with a particularly vulnerable population um, or potentially vulnerable population, I suppose. Um, uh, and it doesn't, the, the applicant does not need to mention the word homeless. They just need to say something like, well, my existing accommodation is so bad that I need to move. Um, and that was followed up uh, um, in Berry and Gibbons, where um, Mr. Gibbons had made an application under part six and question 30 of the form. In answering that, Mr. Gibbons uh, spelt out that he was about to become homeless. And that was regarded as sufficient to trigger the obligations of the council uh, under part seven. Um, so if we just go on to the next screen, Zia, please. And um, uh, because one of the things we now know from Barry and Gibbons is it really doesn't matter which part of the uh, authority uh, the person approaches, if you like. Um, or indeed, I suppose, if the person even needs to approach the authority, if, if the authority approaches the person, which is kind of the question with the rough sleeper being housed in Manchester. But does it matter that it is, in, in Bristol, I think we have a, uh, something called a, uh, a Department of Change or something like that. If it's somebody from the Department of Change who, who is told by the, uh, by the applicant, actually, you know, I'm homeless, and then is that enough? And it seems that it should be. Um, it doesn't matter what department you are going to. Um, the game of pass the parcel has no place in this field, as uh, Lord Donaldson said in, in Ferdus Begum in the Court of Appeal. And although uh, Ferdus Begum went to the House of Lords, um, uh, that point was not, uh, the, the, there was nothing made of that point. So, so this is important and it comes up again in, in, in fact, a case that Zia did, um, uh, Edwards and Birmingham City Council. Um, uh, this uh, Zia and Daniel, in fact, and and um, uh, and I, I think that this is actually rather rather an interesting question that's raised in uh, in the second sentence there. Um, uh, before me, there was some discussion as to whether a Part Seven applicant application could be made to a library assistant or park keeper. Uh, and uh, um, I'd be really interested, actually. <laughs> One of my questions to Zia might be, might be, uh, well, what was discussed there? Because it seems to me that potentially uh, uh, a park keeper who comes across a rough sleeper or somebody sleeping in a tent, who says to, and, uh, and the rough sleeper or the person sleeping in the tent uh, says to the park keeper, actually, I'm homeless, I need somewhere is that could that constitute an application and in, um, uh, I suspect uh, well for myself I would say that it could be. So yeah, could we go on a, a, another slide? Um, so it seems to me that there are three really quite tricky questions here um, and the first tricky question is the one that I've sort of been asking as, I, as I've been going along. Is an application made when a local authority provides hotel type accommodation to a rough sleeper? Well, it seems to me that, that, that to the extent they're seeking the local housing authority's assistance, then potentially it could be. 
And why is that significant? Well, it's significant because, because of course, the duty, the 1881 duty is to provide suitable accommodation. Um, and there are a range of other uh, duties that go with that. The inquiries duty starts, the duty to, look, to, to care for somebody's possessions also. Um, uh, and uh, somebody sent me a, a, a um, uh, uh, something from Kent online that, that suggested that Canterbury City Council were, were taking homeless people's possessions away from them uh, on 24 hours notice. And it seemed to me that, well, if they know that that person is a rough sleeper, could that nevertheless constitute an application and be a breach of duty in that context? Uh, I think that, 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 that there are problems uh, um, that, that, that there, but, but for me, they, uh, um, uh, uh, to, the, to the extent that a person is seeking the local housing authority's assistance, then uh, I, I, it must constitute an application. The second tricky question is around issues of capacity. We know from Ferdis Begum in the House of Lords, um, and uh, which is combined with ex-party garlic, um, that, uh, that a person who, uh, who, who lacks capacity to accept an offer of accommodation cannot be an applicant. But in WB and, and, and WDC, um, which was Martin Westgate's case, um, uh, there's, there are interesting sort of gradations there because uh, somebody could make an application on somebody else's behalf. And for example, if you have a, uh, uh, a deputy that, that has a, that's been appointed, an application could be made by the deputy. So there are issues of capacity um, and issues around who can make an application for somebody who lacks capacity. The last question here, I think it's, is one of the, probably the most interesting questions, um, speaking as an academic, but um, is this question of, of referrals. Uh, the section 213B duty, this is a duty that was brought into uh, effect by the Homelessness Reduction Act um, and, and the specified public authority, and I'll talk about who the specified public authorities are in a moment, they must ask the person to agree to the authority uh, notifying a local housing authority in England. And if that person agrees, then, uh, um, uh, then, the, then the specified public authority notifies the local housing authority. They notify the local housing authority that they consider the person homeless or threatened with homelessness and, uh, and how the local housing authority can contact the person. And that there is a duty on the specified public authority to make that notification. Who are these specified public authorities? Well, they include social services departments, uh, uh, A&Es, urgent treatment centres and hospitals in their function of providing inpatient care. So a range of possible uh, uh, third parties, so to speak, could be providing that referral and, and are under a duty to provide that referral if the, uh, if the person agrees to that notification. The question is whether that referral constitutes an, a, an application in its own right. The code of guidance is really clear. The code of guidance says a referral made by a public authority to the housing authority under section 213b uh, will not in itself constitute an application for assistance. Uh, but housing authorities should always respond to any referral received. Well, I, I, I think those two parts don't necessarily go together because what should the housing authority respond? Well, in, in my uh, view anyway, the housing authority should respond by accepting an application. Um, uh, I think the first part is wrong. Uh, and I think the first part is wrong because the, the local housing authority has everything they need. They have the person's consent. Uh, they, have, they know that the person is homeless or threatened with homelessness. Um, they have reason to believe, in other words. 
um, it seems to me it must follow that uh, that the person has made an application and uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, the Jan Luber in Liz Davis's book agrees with me on that um, uh, or I agree with them depending on how you look at it. Um, uh, Thanks, Zia. Can we go on um, to, to the second question on section 1A1? And this is a sort of suitability question, um, not a sort of, it is a suitability question, but a su suitability is potentially an issue in these cases. And, and you may have seen the BBC report um, uh, and, and indeed other reports where households are having to share facilities. Now, Zia will talk to you about uh, the risk groups later on, but if, but if a person is a in a, a member of the household in a risk group, having to share facilities with others. Um, question, is that accommodation suitable? Um, uh, and the other thing is that all these household, all these rough sleepers that are being provided with accommodation, I mean, it is fantastic that, that, that authorities are doing this, but there have been reports of people with, with support needs being provided with accommodation, hotels, um, type accommodation with zero support and there are real issues there. Can it possibly be said to be suitable if the, if the accommodation is being provided without support? And what if bed and breakfast accommodation is being provided for households with children for longer than, than, the, um, than the max period in, in, in the statutory instrument, the six week period? Um, so I think all of those are, are, are real issues which, which potentially could arise um, and uh, may well require a, a pre-action uh, correspondence. Um, Zia, could we just go on to um, section 190? Um, and uh, uh, so this is the accommodation duty that is owed to uh, people who the local authority determine uh, in their section 184 are intentionally homeless and uh, and the issue here is about reasonable opportunity what is going to be a reasonable opportunity for that uh, household to secure accommodation for that occupation uh, at the moment um, uh, can we just go on again Zia, please um, because we all know, of course, that, 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 well, that, I mean, that, that the types of decision I see are, are very often you've got 28 days uh, kind of thing uh, before we kick you out. And I'll come on to kick out in, in, in a moment. Um, uh, but actually, what is said by the Court of Appeal in Conville is what's reasonable has to come from the applicant's standpoint having regard to their circumstances and in the context of the accommodation potentially available. Um, and I think the, the issue locally is going to be for the local authority being able to say from the applicant's standpoint what accommodation is potentially available. Um, and um, from uh, uh, where I am, there are issues about the, the potential availability of accommodation, uh, rental accommodation at a reasonable price for, um, uh, for households. So it may well be that you should be arguing for an extension in, 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 in the period. Um, uh, and uh, Zira, if we could go on to, to, to the next slide. This is, this is my last slide. Um, and I, this is something that, 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 I, that I personally, I, I'm really quite worried about because uh, we know from uh, CN and Lewisham that the duty can be determined without, uh, the, the section 190 duty can be determined without a court order where the accommodation has been provided under, under license. Well, in that situation, protection from eviction doesn't apply um, and therefore, the practice direction staying all possession claims is irrelevant, doesn't apply. So in that situation, and in, in the situation in which we find ourselves, where say you have a vulnerable person who has been found intentionally homeless, is it, is it um, 
uh, within Wensbury uh, uh, bounds, so to speak, to determine to, to kick somebody out at that point uh, uh, while we are in lockdown mode. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass on to Zia. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I hope you can hear me. And um, thank you to David uh, for that very interesting first half of the seminar. I hope uh, my, my bit will at least uh, be a close second. Um, while I was listening to David, one thing uh, did occur to me, which is this. Arguably, everyone is in priority need. And what I've seen uh, discussed uh, uh, between colleagues and, and uh, uh, other barristers is, no, that can't be right because vulnerability is still a test based on a comparator. And therefore, it can't be the whole population. Uh, but I suggest we're looking at the wrong section. We shouldn't be looking at section 189, subset 1, subsection C. If we look at 1891, subsection D, that says that a person is in priority need if they are homeless as a result of an emergency. That must, in COVID-19, must constitute an emergency. So if you're a single man in your, in, in your early 20s, living sofa surfing, let's say, and the uh, people you're living with turf you out because they don't want to, you know, they want to, uh, uh, not expose themselves to the risk of having someone else living with them. Arguably, I would say, very strongly arguably, you are in priority need because you are homeless as a result of a, a public health emergency. And therefore, you, once you're in priority need, you won't be intentionally homeless, there'll be a duty to accommodate that person. And that duty won't come to an end simply because of public health emergency stops. If you're in priority need, arguably you are in priority need, and if the duty is owed to you, the main housing duty in particular, it can only cease by one of those specified events set out in section 193, which doesn't include the end of, a, of an emergency. So that's, I think that's something worth thinking about, uh, that it's arguable that almost everybody who is made homeless as a result of uh, the people they're living with, asking them to leave because of the emergency, uh, are, are in priority need. Okay, J just going on then to 1883. Uh, uh, we all know this. We know the Mohammed test uh, and the three-stage test that was set out in that case, and which, and I, I've always said rather sadly, seems to have ossified into statute. Uh, it's been repeated so many times in so many cases that rather than going back to 1883 and asking the authority asking itself how shall we exercise our discretion the authority is saying well these are the three tests you have to satisfy if you don't satisfy them we don't have to exercise our discretion now most of the time that will be fine but there will still be the odd case i think where discretion can be wrongly exercised uh, because, for example, the authority says, well, the merits of the case are no good um, and we don't have to go any further. We don't have to look at any new material or, or personal circumstances. So, Mohammed, I, I always like to look at Lumley following the case of Mohammed because the, what's sometimes forgotten about Mohammed is that in that case, Camden had a policy that they would only exercise their discretion in exceptional circumstances. And that was the challenge. Could Camden decide only to exercise their discretion in exceptional circumstances? And the court held that it could because Camden uh, submitted evidence we said that out of sort of 100 applications requesting, interim, uh, requesting a review, only four had been successful. And so in, against those stats, it was uh, perfectly lawful to have that uh, category of only accommodating in exceptional circumstances. 
What we don't know is what each local authority's stats are. And I always, whenever I uh, talk about interim accommodation pending review, I always say, get, make a freedom of information request and request the stats from the local authority. If 70% of reviews are being allowed, 80% of reviews are being allowed, that discretion should be being exercised in a different way. And arguably the Mohammed test should operate differently. The reason Lumley always makes him remember that is because in Lumley, Lord Justice Brooke, when discussing Mohammed, expressly commented on the statistical evidence that had been produced in Mohammed. You know, Lumley is interesting for, another re for, for other reasons, because you've got a 22-year-old single man with antidepressants, he'd been referred to seek psychiatric help, and it just shows you how little has changed between 2001 and 2020, because this could read like a script today. The new provided a medical questionnaire to the GP. The GP filled it in. The, G, the questionnaire and the solicitor's representations were sent to the council medical assessment officer. He didn't see Mr. Lumley. He didn't make his own inquiries. And he said, on the basis of what I've received, Mr. Lumley is not in priority need. There was a request for interim accommodation pending review. That was declined. The decision to decline interim accommodation pending review was successfully challenged. One thing that was sorted out was the merits of the case. Doesn't mean the merits of the substantive case, but the merits of the case that the original decision is flawed. And that would allow you to uh, look at procedural as well as substantive flaws in the original decision. And why was Mr. Lumley's case uh, flawed? Why was the decision flawed? Well, said Lord Justice Brooke, it was even more seriously flawed than Mohammed because there was no proactive inquiry into Mr. Lumley's medical condition and Mr. Lumley wasn't given any opportunity of responding to adverse medical evidence that had been obtained. In most cases I've seen dealing with particularly vulnerability, once the local authority obtains evidence from its own medical advisor, it hardly ever puts it to the applicant before coming to a negative uh, original decision. And therefore, arguably following Lumley, in almost every case, that should be a, a significant procedural deficiency that should cause the authority to exercise its discretion to provide interim accommodation pending review. Lord Justbrook also remarked that in Lumley, the authority hadn't provided any statistics as to how many reviews were successful against the original decision. And that was another reason for allowing the challenge, the refusal of the exercise of discretion. So even if you don't have statistics, it might be worth in any challenge saying, well, we know in uh, ex party Mohammed, there was a very low success rate on review. We simply don't know what that position is in respect to the current authority. Two, two cases at opposite, perhaps opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, France's Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea. Uh, this is a case which is frequently trotted up by local authorities to seek to scare the court to say, well, look, a challenge to a decision to uh, refuse interim accommodation, either pending review or appeal, it faces a real uphill struggle. And if, if the authorities referred to the test and looked at it, that should be the end of the matter. And on the other side, you have the case of Paul Coker, where he says, well, merely paying lip service to the criteria without properly applying them to the facts of a particular case uh, is not going to be sufficient and is going to be unlawful. Section 204A appeals are arguably even more difficult than 1883 applications. I sometimes think to myself that Anyone who looked at 204A uh, in any depth would, would be very cautious before bringing an appeal under this section. Because A, the authorities are very discouraging, but B, the statute itself uh, requires that uh, the court can only order authority to provide interim accommodation is satisfied that failure to exercise power would substantially prejudice the applicant's ability to pursue the main appeal. And that is hardly ever going to be the case. I mean, there are two points I would make. 
Firstly, the court can confirm or quash the decision, uh, which is a separate remedy to the remedy of final remedy of uh, giving, uh, uh, making an order that accommodation be provided. And if you make an application under 204A, seeking the court to quash the decision, then an interim application can also be made for uh, uh, accommodation pending the hearing of the appeal, uh, which the uh, final point can be considered as to whether or not the appeal would be substantially prejudiced. Secondly, uh, in the present circumstances, I suppose if someone is rough sleeping uh, and, uh, or, or is homeless, for example, because they are in accommodation that is not reasonable for them to continue to occupy, if they're at increased risk of becoming seriously ill, then you hopefully would be able to meet that test that your ability to uh, pursue the appeal in those circumstances would be substantially prejudiced. Now, two cases, first instance decisions, where two or four A appeals were allowed. Firstly, is the case of SN and Waltham Forest, in which the appeal is allowed on the basis of the third limb of the Mohammed test, namely personal circumstances, had not been adequately considered. Because, said the uh, county court judge, there's no hierarchy in the Mohammed formula. We know we always go merits, new information, consequences. But, said the judge, there's no hierarchy in that formula and personal circumstances were capable of tipping the balance in the claimant's favour, regardless of the underlying merits. Now that, you can see, might be very significant uh, in the light of the present COVID-19 emergency. And, and the judge said, well, look, the consequence of a negative decision on accommodation pending appeal had not been properly considered. So you've got to think what will, the authority has to think and explain what will happen if we don't provide uh, interim accommodation pending appeal. And in the present circumstances, uh, it would be difficult for an authority to say, well, there will be no negative uh, consequences. And then the case of Forveig and Lambeth Lunderborough Council, it, again, is an interesting case because it discusses the public sector equality duty in the exercise of discretion. So we, we all know that when a local authority makes any decision, it's got to have due regard to the public sector equality duty obligations. The judge said in this case that that is a separate exercise when you're considering the 204A discretion whether or not to accommodate pending appeal. So you obviously consider the PSED in the decision under review, but then even if that original decision is negative, when you're considering the exercise of discretion, you have to consider the PSED again. And I see many decisions where there hasn't been a separate PSED consideration at the time of exercise of discretion. So we should all be alert and aware of that. So COVID-19, some, some obvious points. Firstly, we know that uh, the, the, the rule appears to be, the rule is, that we can only leave our homes for essential journeys. We shouldn't be admitting visitors unless it's for reasons of treatment or social care. Well, that means that the person who sofa surfs and is, and is thrown out really shouldn't be joining any other unit because they would be saying, well, we can't admit a visitor. Uh, so arguably, again, um, it's relevant to the exercise of discretion, whether someone should be accommodated or not, because their personal freedom has been greatly restricted by the regulations. The second thing to think about is the impact of the emergency on persons with pre-existing physical and mental health issues. But we forget the section 1891 subsection D point, and if we look at 1891 subsection C, even if a person under that uh, 1891 C might not be uh, vulnerable by reason of mental or, or physical ill health, does the impact of the emergency, is that a relevant factor that comes in under some other special reason? 
which means that it gives that just that further little nudge to shift the person into vulnerability status. And the third thing that the COVID-19 emergency obviously makes us uh, focus on are the possible adverse consequences of not accommodating. And if those are particularly adverse, then we would argue that it could trump the other parts of the Mahanu test, even where, where the, the other arguments are not that strong. So in light of this, it's, it's uh, important, I think, to bear in mind what the regulations say. They, they came into force on the 26th of March, 2020. And interestingly, they had their own definition of a vulnerable person. They're not using vulnerability in the same way that it's used in the Housing Act. But a vulnerable person is defined as any person who's age 70 or over. And so we would argue that that should now be carried over into the into 1891C. Any person under 70 who has an underlying health condition, including but not limited to the conditions listed in Schedule 1. So any person who has an underlying health condition is deemed to be vulnerable for the purposes of the regulations. I see no reason why the same test should not be imported into the vulnerability test for now under the 96 Act. And if the authority is going to depart from that, I think they have to explain why. And I suspect we'll be, insofar as colleagues are dealing with this issue, uh, I suspect a lot of these boilerplate standard decision letters will not have expressly referred to these regulations. And that immediately is, uh, is, an, uh, is unlawful because there's been a failure to take a relevant matter into account. Schedule one of the regulations set out what underlying conditions uh, are given by way of example. So chronic respiratory diseases, such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema or bronchitis, chronic heart disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease and chronic neurological conditions. Now you would hope that, that certainly people with a chronic, uh, chronic neurological condition or chronic liver disease would be uh, automatically in priority need. But of course, we know that's not the case. And frequently people with hep hepatitis, for example, are told they're not vulnerable. Uh, well, here's here the regulation saying that those people should be considered uh, to be vulnerable. Just carrying on, this is the carrying on with Schedule 1, person with diabetes, Person, person has problems with the spleen, person with a weakened immune system, or a person who's seriously overweight with a body mass index of 40 or above. Um, so that's something worth uh, considering, uh, that if someone is seriously overweight, that they should now be deemed to be vulnerable and in priority need. So just a quick run through of challenging a refusal to exercise discretion. Look, at, look to see whether any legal errors in the main decision. Has there been inadequate inquiry or any inquiry? Has there been a breach of natural justice? A, a favorite of mine is a repeated uh, sentence in decision letters which says, well, your functionality has not been affected and therefore you're not uh, vulnerable. Well, we know given the rate Martin's recent case of Geist that you can't say that anymore. There's no such thing as a functionality test in vulnerability cases. That would be an automatic error in the main decision. Has there just been a blind formulaic recitation of the Mohammed test? I, it's not good enough for the local authority to say, this is what you say is wrong with you. This is the Mohammed test. Our decision is we're not going to exercise our discretion. That's not enough. There has to be some application of the facts to the law and there has to be some analysis provided. Thirdly, in terms of is there new material? Well, again, arguably the COVID-19 emergency, if that is not something that existed at the time of the original decision, is automatically something that will constitute new material. And we would argue you should leave the authority to provide interim accommodation pending a review or, and or appeal. And finally, has the authority properly considered the PSED? on the exercise of discretion. While I was um, 
uh, preparing these slides, uh, another thought occurred to me, which is this. There appears to be some evidence that uh, black and minority ethnic people are being more significantly adversely affected by COVID-19 um, uh, than, uh, than, than you, white people. Um, I, I don't know if there's any final concluded medical view on that, but that's certainly something that uh, is something is being explored by way of inquiry. And therefore, as well as um, disability being relevant, when the public sector equality duty is considered, arguably race has become relevant as well. And so has the, has the authority, when declining interim accommodation pending of your appeal, consider the relevance of the person's race on their decision because i would argue that if they haven't then that decision is unlawful then again in terms of the relevant considerations taken into account have they taken the regulations into account and have they explained in a vulnerability case why a person is vulnerable under regulation is not deemed to be vulnerable under the housing act 1996 i think they should have to discharge thought should have to discharge at that burden. Now, final slide is uh, the admin court guidance on urgent work. And the, that is the link to it. I'm just bringing it up on another hand. So what, what this says is, is this, that applications have to be filed by email uh, to that, to that uh, email address. And the inbox we monitored between 9.30 and 4.30. And outside those hours, then the existing hours out of our procedure will apply. Um, in the case where the application is filed by a legal representative, you've got to have an electronic bundle containing only those documents which is ne are necessary for the court to read for the purposes of determining the application. The bundle has to be a single PDF. It mustn't exceed 20 megabytes. It must be numbered in ascending order, regardless of whether multiple documents have been combined together. Um, and the index has to be paginated as well. And, and as must authorities. So everything must be numbered as part of the single PDF document. And then there are technical things like the default display size must always be 100%. Bookmark must be labeled. Text on all pages must be selectable. And then, rather optimistically, the uh, guidance says the index page must be hyperlinked. Um, I've been involved in a couple of judicial reviews since the uh, emergency. And although we've managed more or less to comply with the other requirements, well, we haven't, I have to say, always got it under 20 megabytes, but the court appears to be a little bit flexible about that. Uh, I don't think we've quite managed to do the hyperlinking. Now, I'd question the use of that, uh, although accepting that it has to be done, when everything is going to be bookmarked anyway. Right, that is the end of my part of the seminar. I mean, I'm going to go back to Ben uh, to see if there are any questions. Great, great. Well, thanks, David and Zia, very much for, I think, uh, what people will agree were two very thought-provoking presentations. Um, we've had uh, a few questions come in. Um, one of them is from Derek Bernardi. Hi, Derek, saying, I agree with Zia's argument regarding Section 1891D, that's about priority need in emergencies. But how would you respond to a local housing authority who argues that such applicant was already homeless? And so is not homeless as a result of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, and I, I, I think Derek's right. I think that raises a, a real difficulty. If you've got somebody who is sofa surfing or in a very tenuous position and they are then turned out, the authority might well be able to say, well, actually, you were homeless anyway. Uh, and your homelessness hasn't been caused by the COVID crisis. Um, and there is a case called Higgs and Brighton and Hove um, from 2003, and, and that's posted up, the reference is posted up on the answers 
which I think will be on the website afterwards, um, where somebody was in a caravan parked illegally um, and the caravan was stolen. And the uh, Court of Appeal agreed with the authorities' line of argument, which said, well, actually, this is an emergency, but it hasn't caused your homelessness because you were homeless before. Um, a, a, a couple of points about that. I mean, um, I think uh, there's a reply up, which, which I'll ask David to talk about in a moment. Um, one other thought that occurs to me is that it, it, is that the issue about homelessness really boils down to whether it's reasonable for you to continue to occupy accommodation. And it does seem to me there's a big difference between a voluntarily occupying accommodation um, and um, occupying accommodation because you've got no choice. And it, there might be scope for arguing that you're not homeless if you are voluntarily in a situation which might, if it was against your will, uh, be unreasonable for you to remain in. That's my only thought about it. Dave, Dave did you want to add something about the, the response as well? Um, well, well there, are, there were two points I, I, I thought. One, one, is, one is a sort of partial response to, to, to the question, that is to suggest that uh, we might be invulnerable as a result of a special reason uh, category. Um, and that's not beyond the bounds of, of possibility and vulnerability, particularly if you're in one of the risk factors um, uh, in, uh, as Sears outlined. But there is, um, and, and I, I'm interested in, in, in what you both think about this, but say during the COVID-19, um, uh, there is domestic violence, which leads to somebody being, um, uh, say, uh, uh, the the um, uh, um, the recipient of the domestic violence having to leave the accommodation, and um, there is a question there about their homelessness as a result of. In, in one sense, domestic violence, and it's a sort of the, the, the causation issue. Um, but I, for me, I think that, that it's, it must be at least arguable that one is homeless as a result of uh, um, the emergency, which, which potentially has resulted in, in the domestic violence being caused to the person. But, uh, um, I'd be interested in, in, in what you and Ben and, and Zia think about that. Zia, is there anything you want to, to add to those? Yes, well, I think it, to some extent, it may depend on the facts of a case, but if someone's been living somewhere, sofa surfing in the same premises for 12 months, um, so there, there are, they're an excluded licensee. They've got no right of occupation, but that's been their home for a significant period of time. Uh, and then once this emergency starts, they are told that you've got to leave now because it's a risk to our health uh, to mix with, uh, we're just isolating, we're going to be in this small group, we can no longer accommodate you. And you are then, you then leave where you've been staying for about 12 months I think always oh, six months or two or three months. I think a court is going to have sympathy with an argument that you are homeless as a result of the emergency, um, because that, to all extent and purposes, had had been your home. Yeah. So the scope scope for arguments, and um, and I agree. I think with with Dave on causation. I mean, it's clear you're going to have to prove causation. Um, but uh, the section doesn't say anything about it being direct causation. So if the COVID crisis prompts some other uh, uh, issue like domestic violence, that, that, that may well be satisfied. So it, I think definitely worth exploring. Um, we've had some posts for, from William Flack. Hi, hi, hi William, to say, um, raise the issue about bundling on emergency applications to the admin court. Um, and um, pointing out you can use Adobe Acrobat to, to put hyperlinks around the index page. 
Um, but he and, and I would be interested to know how difficult um, it's proven to get the admin court to accept the electronic bundles and how tricky they've been or how uh, particular they've been about the, the published requirements. Um, certainly I've heard of, of, of solicitors filing bundles that are under 20 megabytes in accordance with the guidance and having slaved to get them ready for that. Uh, and the admin court have been back on the phone saying, well, actually we can't accept this because we can't save anything bigger than I think 10 megabytes. Um, if you have had experiences, please post them on the chat forum um, uh, and we'll we'll try and relay them. Well, no, um, could, perhaps I could just add something to that, just to, just uh, on uh, uh, Central London County Court practice, um, because I had a Section Two Hundred Four appeal at Central London by Skype for Business, and they required the electronic bundle in that uh, appeal to be less than 50 pages, which when you consider the review decision and the skeleton arguments, you've probably got about 10 pages left for, um, for, 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 for documents, which seems to be unrealistic. And I took some flack from a particular judge um, for having a bundle that was 150 pages. And I just, you know, I mean, what can you do? Um, uh, so my experience has been, I think, three judicial or four judicial reviews we filed during the emergency period um, and the courts have been the admin court office has been kind so far and that I, I know that not all of those bundles complied with the guidance and the bundles were not returned and in fact in one case the bundle was hundreds of pages over and was indexed incorrectly and it, 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 all, everything had gone horribly wrong um, and the judge still looked at the bundle and, and made the order. But perhaps that was in the early days and they may be getting stricter as time goes on. I do think that the 50 pages is, a, is very difficult when the review decision can be 15 pages. Yeah, quite. Um, and actually, just, just to echo Sia, um, I mean, my experience is the Admin Court have raised issues, but actually they've let it through. And they may be asking to file, split the thing after all into two documents and file it. And they make noises about the judge possibly refusing to look at it. But I haven't yet seen one that's actually been um, knocked back. Um, I've had, we've had a, a question from Mike McIlvenny I, um, to say, I imagine that the exercise of the discretion to grant relief may be a real problem in circumstances where an authority also seeks to rely on the emergency for arguing that they cannot do what the law requires them to do. Well, um, I, yeah, 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 perhaps you, you, you see what that Well, I, I think we, uh, and perhaps I'll be proved wrong and it won't be for the first time, but it seems to me that we should take a very hard line to this argument. Firstly, where the government wanted to ease statutory requirements, say for example under the CARE Act, a, a considered system of easements, whether you like it or not, has been put into place where a local authority can give notification that it will no longer comply with its duties under the, the certain aspects of the CARE Act. That's no such easements regime has been brought in for the Housing Act 1996 and therefore it must, until the law is uh, uh, eased or put into abeyance, it's got to be complied with. And impossibility is not a defense under the Housing Act, as we know, because just uh, by way of a trite example, in suitability cases, once you fall below a certain level of suitability, the authority cannot say, cannot rely on a resources defense. And the same must apply in this scenario. Now, it might be relevant to relief and the exercise of discretion, but that will have to be a nuanced uh, explanation by the authority and a careful analysis by the court. And I would be, uh, I don't think it's right that the authority can simply say there is this emergency and therefore we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I think that, that would be a dangerous approach. 
just to add on that, I mean, if you've got a situation where, for example, an applicant is put in accommodation where they can't self-isolate or follow the guidance in some way, um, then it seems to me that will often involve not only their individual needs, but also a wider public health issue. Um, and certainly in, not in homelessness cases, but some asylum support cases uh, that I've been involved in recently, the judges have been quite receptive, I think, to arguing that there's an overriding public health need to make sure that people are able to follow the guidance that, that's been issued by central government on, on isolating and social distancing. Um, we, we've had a post from Jonathan Boyle to say... Can I, can I just add, can I just add, 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 to, add to those points? Because, because, first of all, it's just to say what you guys said. Um, uh, I, I agree. But secondly, just to note that on the Section 190 duty, actually resources are not relevant there. The, the relevant thing is, is um, the personal uh, uh, appreciation of the applicant. So just, just, just to add that point there. Um, that's what uh, Lord Justice Pill said in, in Cadena. It's not uninteresting. Ed, not Cadena, um, whatever the case it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. We, we, just to pick up, um, Jonathan, I think, has post, posted on a similar issue, just saying about suitability of interim accommodation. What would be the best way to deal with local authorities using the COVID crisis as an excuse not to provide? suitable accommodation. I think that's pretty much the, the issue that we've been yeah. addressing, unless either of you have got something to add on that. I just don't, you know, I just like to say we, we should not roll over and play dead on this issue. We should insist on uh, people being uh, entitled to the benefit of any legal duty owed to them. Mm -hmm. And if there is a discretionary argument, if there's an argument to be made as to relief, then the authority's got to set out why it can't do anything. And it's got to have systems in place to do it. Because this may go on for 12 months, it may go on for 18 months. So uh, there may be some sh initial sympathy from the court, but if we're still in this position in three months time, surely authority can't say, well, we can't do anything because of the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, that's, it's tough, but you know, until the act itself allows a get out, the act has to be followed. Yeah. Good. Well, I think we've um, looked at most of the questions that have been posted. Um, just to go back to the first one um, about uh, vulnerability or priority you need on the basis of, of being made homeless uh, because of the emergency, the COVID crisis. Um, Derek's made a suggestion, which I think is right, uh, which is your well, position is going to be better if the uh, fr friend or relative who has turned you out is willing to write or confirm that they would have let you stay, but for the crisis. I mean, it seems to me then it, it, you're on a better footing to say, well, actually, I was happy there, I could have stayed there, it would have been reasonable for me to continue to occupy it, and therefore. I have been made homeless as a result of the mm. crisis. So I think that's a really um, practical suggestion. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that um, deals with the questions that have been posted. Um, so thank you, Azia. Thank you, David, for, for the presentation. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for coming along to the webinar. Um, and I'm not sure what we've got in line next for the seminars, but we will be running a series of seminars pretty regularly on, uh, on current issues during this difficult period. So thank you everybody, stay well, um, but that's the end of the seminar.